Today we're going to have a look at an Old Testament passage, the one that you had up front on the screen earlier on that Mark read to us. And I will go through it again because I think it's important to get it fresh in our memories as we study the Word and we look deep at what the Lord says to us. Now, for most of us, the Old Testament is that old book that is just a lot of stories and sort of we can't often relate to. But I want to look at it again today from a fresh set of eyes and try and see it and see what the message is and how it relates to us even to today. So we're going to look at Exodus 4 and we're going to read verses 1 through 9 again. And I want you to put yourselves in the position of Moses. Remember who he is, this guy who is now, how old would you remember him as being? 80 years old, okay? Now, not too many 80 year olds in this room, uh, but I'm sure a lot of us are heading in that direction and even if you have to look back on your life now, how old you are, and if you haven't had God in your life, what it would be like to have a sudden appearance of the Lord. So we're going to read this, and I want you to just think of yourself as if you were in this situation. This burning bush has just happened, and now the Lord is speaking to Moses. So let's start in verse 1. It says, And then Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. So the Lord has given him instructions to go back to Egypt, to speak to Pharaoh. That is the situation that we're seeing here and developing. The Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? And he said, a staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it. And it became a staff in his hand that they may believe the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Again the Lord said to him, Put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was as leprous, as leprous as snow. Then God said, Put your hand back inside your cloak. So he put his hand back inside his cloak, and when he took it out, behold, it was restored, like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you, God said, or listen to you the first sign, they may not, they may believe the latter sign. If they will not believe you, even these two signs, or listen to your voice, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground, and the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. Let's just open it in prayer. Lord and Heavenly Father, again as we study your word and we see the message before us we pray for clear eyes and understanding as we look at it and we see how you worked in the lives of Moses and the Israelites back in that time but we also see within those messages messages that we can work with and relate to in our own lives Lord we pray that as we go out in our day to day that we will remember you and we'll remember the lessons and we'll reach out to others, that we'll use what we learn as stepping stones to teach others about you. Lord, we just thank you for this wonderful book that, as old as it is, it is still relevant to today. We thank you for it, and we pray for the message today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I believe most of you are South Africans. I don't think there's any visiting person from outside, and so... Most of you have experienced life in South Africa. You will have experienced, some of you maybe people that have been robbed or people that have been in a crime situation or in a situation that is typically South African and not um, something that you would advise other people to go through. Now I know at one stage I had uh, a KFC in, in Mams of Toti and like anything that is a cash business, we had people wanting to share with our wealth. And the one KFC we had opened that same day, and we'd opened it at four o'clock, and at 10 o'clock that same day, people came climbing through the drive through window and held us up and took whatever they could. 
Now, looking back over time, and I'm sure this is something that I'm going to get you all to relate to, is that you always look at a situation and you think, how could I have done it differently? Would I have grabbed the gun and wrestled it from the guy, or would I have complied differently, or what would I have done differently? And we can do that not only in a crime situation, we can do it in relationship situations. We can think of ways where we've had a fight with maybe a family member and we sit back and think, how can I do it differently? If only I could have gone back and done something another way, things wouldn't have turned out the way that they are now. Now, as much as those are the situations that we have today, they're not something that's new. It's not something like that only our generation experiences that. And when I look at the characters in the Bible, I have to look at them as being special. Well, we think of them as being special, as people that are different to us. They're not almost like flesh and blood, they're almost like these superhuman people. When I see Moses, I see this parting of the Red Sea and the fire on the mountain, the Ten Commandments. You know, when I read the Bible, I see David killing Goliath, this superhuman, like almost like a Superman type character. And Daniel in the lion's den, you know, you've got Daniel sitting there, and 20 or 30 lions all like lying peacefully around him, and it's like, wow, these people are just supernatural, superhuman. It's almost like they've got the Zen power when it comes to dealing with God, you know, that, that we connected in different ways to what us normal people are like. But as I took time to study the scriptures, I've come to see a different side of people. When I look at the characters in the Bible, and I take time to look at them, and that's what I think most of us have started to see, I see a David, not as a David and Goliath person, but a David that's struggling with sin issues. I saw Daniel trying to hold down a job, an executive job. If you think about Daniel, he was second in charge of the kingdom. And here he is in a pagan world. And then I see Moses as a person that's given up on life. Think about Moses before the burning bush. When we place Moses on the mountain before God has spoken to him, have you ever thought what he must have been replaying in his mind? You know, we were talking about that, going back and saying, if I could have done something differently. Here he is, 18 years of age, in the middle of nowhere. All alone on a mountain. He's chosen to be all alone on a mountain. Where he could dwell on his past and analyze how he could have been doing it differently. I see how he looked at his life as once he was the prince of Egypt. For 40 years he'd been the prince of a whole realm of people. With everything that he could have asked for. All the riches. And I think he believed God had put him there for a possible solution to the prophecy that was in Genesis 15, verse 13 through 14, where God had told Abram that they would be in bondage for 400 years. He probably looked at that and saw himself as being the saviour, and yet it didn't turn out that way. And here he is, a lonely shepherd, or a lowly shepherd on a forgotten part of the world, not anything special, far from that prince in Egypt. And I see him sitting there, on the side, probably flicking a stone down the hillside, looking at the sheep and just wondering about life and how life is finished for him. Now, if we're going to look at shepherds, we're going to just put the shepherding in perspective. Now, in Christ's day, shepherds stood at the bottom rank of the Jewish social system. They were those lowly guys. Now, if you look around in today's society, we always have structures, you know, the the people, the politicians, the doctors, the lawyers, they're the, they the <coughs> clever guys at the top. And then you go all the way down and maybe you've got street sweepers or car guards down here that everyone may be looking at differently and not impressed by. But in society in Israel, shepherds were down there. They were those lowly people that you sort of threw your 10 cents worth as you went past. Their working in the field seven days of a week in the week meant that they were not able to worship in the temple regularly because their job was a 24-7 one. 
and doing the cleanliness rituals and showing the outward appearance of faith, they weren't able to do that. You know, the strict system in the Jewish law is you had to wash and clean. If you were a shepherd, you were out there with the sheep, you were dirty, you were dealing with stuff that was unclean in the, in the societal viewpoint. So shepherds were really people that you didn't like to be hanging around with much. And they were considered untrustworthy and could not be called on as a witness in a court. Which is interesting when you see who were the first people that came and witnessed the birth of Jesus Christ. It was the shepherds. Not some special lawyer that had all the credentials. It was these people that were literally looked down upon and not even reliable as, as witnesses in the court of law. And they would share the same unenviable status as tax collectors and dung sweepers. And only Luke mentions them in the, in the Gospels. But during the time of the patriarchs, this is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they had a noble occupation. They were seen as a much more status-filled occupation. Remember, Abraham was considered a very wealthy guy because he had these huge flocks and Lot, his nephew, was also a guy of, of wealth and stature and they were almost fighting for land. In fact, they were fighting for position because their flocks of sheep and, and goats and whatever else they had were so large that they were fighting for uh, grazing uh, territory. Now, shepherds are mentioned early in the Bible, right through Genesis 4, verse 20. Jabal is called the father of those living in tents and raising livestock. And in nomadic societies, everyone, whether you were a sheikh or a slave, was considered a shepherd. That was part of what you did. It was your daily lifestyle. Even the wealthy sons of Isaac and Jacob tended the flocks. Genesis 30, verse 29 through 37, verse 12, you see Jethro, the priest of Midian, he's employed his daughters as shepherdresses. When the twelve tribes of Israel migrated to Egypt, they encountered a lifestyle that was foreign to them. See, they were the shepherd people, whereas the Egyptians, they were land cultivators. They raised or grew crops. So they didn't like shepherds because shepherds and crops and sheep and crops don't go well together. Certainly not for the guys with the crops. And because the Egyptians were the agriculturists, and as farmers they despised these shepherds because they would be a rough bunch of guys and their sheep would destroy their crops. Now if you look back in history, the very first murder in history was an issue between a farmer and a shepherd. And you remember that story of Cain and Abel, the one that brought his sheep to the, to the offering and the one that brought his crops to the offering. So Egyptians considered sheep worthless for food and sacrifice. In Egyptian art forms and historical records that portray shepherds negatively. Neighboring Arabs, the enemy, were shepherds and Egyptians hated the and, and their hatred climaxed when shepherd kings seized the lower Egypt. That's the history of shepherds in Egypt. So we have this climate where the Jews have moved in, this group of shepherds have moved into a, a nation that despises them. So Pharaoh's clean shaven court looked down on these rugged shepherd sons of Jacob. And Joseph, matter of fact, he informed his brothers, if we go back, every shepherd is detestable to the Egyptians. So when they came in, he said, watch out guys, these guys don't like you, they think lowly of you. And in the course of 400 years, the Egyptians changed the Israelites' attitude towards shepherding. So they got modified, their thinking changed from being these guys that looked after sheep, they slowly adopted the Egyptian culture. Jacob's descendants became accustomed to a settled lifestyle, no more riding around and finding grazing land. They were settled in the place that they moved to when they first entered into Egypt. After the settling of Israel, shepherding ceased to hold its prominent position in their society. As the Israelites acquired more farmland and pasturing decreased, 
shepherding became a menial job for the laboring class. So they got to be like the Egyptians. You know how often we say you become like the people that you associate with. These Jews that used to be shepherd people became just like the Egyptians. Agriculturalists sitting there looking at their crops and despising what they had been before. So when agriculture became part of family life, the youngest boy in the family became the shepherd of the sheep. Especially when the father is a shepherd as well as being a farmer of grain. So we remember that. Who was that very person? If we look back in the Bible. As the older son grew, grows up, he transfers his energies from sheep raising to helping the father with sowing, plowing and harvesting the crops. And passes on the shepherd's task to the younger boy. And so the job is passed from older to younger until the youngest of all becomes the family shepherd. The person that we're thinking of is David. Remember when Samuel came to look for David to crown him as king, where was he? Not with his brothers and the father at home. He was out in the fields. That young son that nobody even thought about, he was pushed aside to go and bring up the sheep. Remember in Samuel 1 verse 16 through 11 it said, Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. So Moses, who has been a prince in Egypt, had two sons, and by rights one of them should have been out there tending the sheep. Not necessarily him, the head of the house. According to where they had gone structurally, he could quite easily have said to his sons, or even his youngest son, go out and look at the sheep. Moses was truly a changed man, no longer that proud prince who had been going out to save the nation. He was now a humble shepherd who didn't even value his own position higher than his sons. You see where Moses now is? He's a broken man on a mountainside that thinks life has gone, has passed him by. He's no good to anyone. He's literally waiting for the end to come in some time in, in the future. So as we look at the life of Moses, we're going to see three valuable lessons. The first thing is that God does not value pride and importance. Moses thought he could kill the Egyptian and somehow orchestrate the salvation of his people. He thought his position and power was how God was going to deliver the nation. He thought he knew it all, is basically what he said. I'm in the right place, but he got the timing of it wrong. Okay? He thought he had been put there and he was going to make it happen. But Isaiah 55, verse 9 through 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your ways, or your thoughts. You see, Moses thought he had it figured out, but he wasn't looking at how God had got it figured out. He was only useful to God when his pride was gone and it was no longer about him. It was no longer about him being the hero. Because in the end, all the glory belongs to God. It's not about us. It's about who we worship. It's about the God that we worship. It is an important lesson for us when we are doing God's work. It is important that we stick to the truth and do not use false information or try and convince someone about the Bible. You know, so often we look at, especially if you're on Facebook and a lot of the social media, you see these people posting things of these giants and say, well, the Bible's true because there's giant skeletons that have been found. And then you find out that someone's going and photoshopped a picture to make it look like there was an actual giant here. And there's so many examples of people that twist things in, in life or tell stories that are bigger than what they are, almost like trying to help God to prove that the Bible is correct. And I'm sure a lot of you will know other ones that are similar to that. But we don't need to do that. The Bible in and of itself is the truth. We only need to point people to God and the Bible. The scriptures will do the rest. We don't need to be the hero in the picture. Moses never consulted God 
for direction, but instead chose to provide his own solution. While he must have known about God from his mother and identified himself with the Israelites, as Hebrews 11 verse 24 says, he never consulted God. But he did have an understanding of who God was, because Hebrews says, By faith Moses, when he was grown, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So he identified with, with the Jews, his, his family. And even Acts 7 verse 24 tells us, And when he saw one of them being wronged, Moses went to his defense and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian who was oppressing him. Now underline this word, he assumed, underline assumed, that's important. His brother, he assumed his brothers would understand that God was using him to deliver them, but they did not. You see, God did not go to God. Sorry, Moses did not go to God. He was assuming under his own thoughts, will, and ideas how this was going to work out. We never read about Moses ever praying to God and seeking his counsel ever till God met him on the mountain. Not once does, you, does, God, does Moses ever go to God and ask him how to work through a situation. It's all about how he's going to do it. And yet Proverbs 3 verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Those are wise words that we need to consider all the time because it's quite easy for us. Especially when we start to think that we know a lot about the Bible or know a lot about it. Maybe we just smart people. We've been to college or varsity and got degrees and we really know a lot about things that other people don't and we start getting an opinion about ourselves. We need to check on it from what the Bible says. Lean not on our understanding, but trust in the Word of God. Trust in the Lord. The third thing is, just because we cannot see or understand God's plan does not mean He isn't working in our lives. You know, so often we go through a day-to-day -day situation, week by week, nothing seems to be materializing, and we just think that God is nowhere in the picture. That God is not really around. He's that far distant person. And after 80 years without God, Moses thought he was a failure and of no importance to anyone. Here he was on the mountainside. And technically he was a failure. Romans 5 verse 3 says, Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. See again, underline that word. At the right time Christ died for the ungodly. See, God has a plan and it will work out at the time that He wants that plan to work out. Not when we wanted to do it. Now I know within my own heart, I come from an industry that everything has to be very quick. I was 15 years in KFC and it's drilled into you. You've got to have a server customer with a minute and a half. And when I moved from KFC into the engineering side, it was a breakdown system. And again, it's a case of you've got to get out there. You've got to get these guys fixed and working as fast as possible. And often I'd, when I'm dealing with people and, and trying to share the gospel with them and things like that, it's like, come on, hurry up, give your life to Christ, there's no time to waste, get on, learn, you know, it's that, hurry up and do it. But often in God's plan, everything is over a period of time and at the right time. We don't understand it always, and in most cases we don't understand it, but we have to trust that He's got it in His control. So what we learn is that God equips His servants in two main ways. What we learned in the past few weeks is that God works behind the scenes directing our path. God's work of equipping Moses began the day he was born. God used Pharaoh's hate to issue a decree that would see Moses put in the palace. 
And yet he was taught the ways of the Egyptians and given a title which would one day give him access back to Pharaoh and also the understanding of how the Egyptian worked, what his mindset was like. Even Moses' own bunglings put him in the desert for a period of time where he could learn about the struggles of life in a harsh environment, something that he would need one day when he took his own people and led them through the promised land. So for 80 years where he thought he was being totally wasted and unused, he was actually being prepared and prepped for this great time where God was going to move his people at the right time. Secondly, we saw in the scripture that we've been reading today, God provides us tools to encourage and teach us. We must always, always remember when we do God's work, we do it not only in His strength, but with His provision. If we make ourselves and our gifts and talents available to Him, He will take them and stamp His name on them. It is not our voice that we sing with, it's God's voice. He's given us that talent. It's not our voice that we teach with, but it's God's voice. It's God's understanding that He put in us. It's not our hands that we work with, but God's. It's not our compassion that we help with, it's God's. Everything that we do, God has given us the giftings to do that. We've just got to look at what we can do and step forward in faith and use those talents that we have for the gospel, for sharing or reaching out. See, by turning his staff, or the staff in his hands, into a snake, God, God demonstrated that he had the power over nature. The snake has always been a symbol of the devil. Moses must have known that the power of the devil was very real in Egypt. Remember how powerful the magicians in Egypt were. The magi magicians were the were in the land of Egypt and they too could do many of the signs and wonders and Moses needed to know that God within him, the God that was in him was greater than the devil. He knew what Egypt had. He'd been in the place where he'd seen those Egyptian magicians working. He knew what he was up against. By turning Moses' hand leprous, he showed him that he had control over their lives. I mean, we've just gone through this COVID-19 and probably we're still going through a bit more of it. And there are many people that are afraid of what COVID-19 can do to us. Now, if we're afraid of COVID-19 today, just imagine in the days of Moses when leprosy was one of those diseases that was the most feared. You know, if you got leprosy, you were cast out, you were isolated, put aside, you were not part of society because this was a disease that was going to rot your way to nothing and people were terrified of it just like COVID-19 is something that terrifies many people to today. So imagine when Moses put his hand inside his cloak and pulled it out and he sees death on his hand. This is going to kill him. What must he have thought then? And yet when he put it back and turned it and it was as clean as the rest of his body. Isn't he going to trust God more now? Wouldn't you? Moses was 80 years old and I can only wonder what God was thinking when he asked an 80 year old man to travel to Egypt and set the children of Israel free. Now God used this sign to show him that he could take care of his physical needs. Because when you look at 80 year old people, most of us have got grandfathers, parents, or even some of us are nearing that age, when you're getting to that stage where you worry about steps because if you fall down and you break a bone, it's normally, and especially in 80 year old and 90 year old people, when you break that hip, it's generally like a sign that this is it. You're not going to recover from that. Moses and Midian was going to have to travel by foot for hundreds of kilometers at 80 years of age, he was going to have to know that God was going to look after him. Do you remember the testimony of Moses and his health just prior to his death? His natural strength had not gone. 
his eyes were not dim, and God would provide for him and two million Jews in the wilderness for 40 years. By turning the water into blood, they saw he could control the source of life itself. God was in control of the very nature around us. There was nothing that was out of God's control. God had given all the signs that he needed to go forward and have complete confidence in who he was. And we need to know when we read the Bible and when we study the Word and we look at the events around us, that nothing that is happening now is out of God's control. And that's why it's so important that we study the Scripture, because that is the tool that God has given us to have confidence in who He is. When we see the things that are happening, when we see the wars in the Middle East, when we see China rising, when we see conflict in our own country, we shouldn't be afraid, we should be confident that God is in control and He's already said these things are going to happen. We should be looking upwards and we should be saying, this is the time I should be really passionate about telling my neighbor about Christ because He is returning soon. So God knew that Moses needed these signs. And with these signs He would tell Moses that when He pours the water in the Nile River on the ground it would become blood. Blood also speaks of forgiveness that we have in Christ. God would use this sign to help Moses overcome his own emotional needs as well. Remember, he was a killer. He had murdered somebody. He had done a lot of things wrong in his own life. And there are many people who would serve Christ but are afraid to say anything to others because of the fear of what has they've done in their own past. They need to know that the blood of Christ has cleansed us. So God sends Moses to... Sorry, God sent Moses to Pharaoh to tell him who he was, who God was. The message that I am going to give the world is not about myself, but about God's amazing grace. So when Moses went there, this lowly shepherd, Pharaoh didn't see him as the threat, but it was God's power that he was going to see. Today we can be encouraged that God is still working in our lives and no matter what we've done in the past I'm confident that God is able to use me and is able to use you for his glory we can't have an excuse and say I've done this and God no longer can use me if he can use Moses at 80 years of age with nothing to show but 40 years of sitting in the desert watching over sheep he can use any one of us God provided signs to encourage Moses today as believers. We have the word of God to build us up and encourage us. So like, like Moses, we can still, or we can use it to encourage other believers. We need to stop doubting that we have nothing to contribute and realize that nothing in the hands of man is something in the hands of God. No matter how small, God can use your service for him and make an incredible impact. If you look at stories of the great preachers that have come to faith. Many of them came to faith not because they heard a wonderful message at a huge revival concert, but like Spurgeon, a guy that wandered into a church that he was escaping a storm from, to hear a message from a member of the congregation who wasn't even the trained pastor and gave a mumbling 10 minutes message out of the word, and pointed to him and said he needed to be saved. And God used that man and that small message to turn a man who would go on to be one of the greatest preachers of all time. We can do things if we prepare to stand up and just be that person. Don't ever give up and say, I am useless. God can do anything. And in closing, we're going to have a look at a little story here. When the cathedral in Milan was finished, in the vast throng of people that assembled to witness the dedication of this church, a little small girl was heard to cry out in childish joy as she pointed to the great building. I helped to build that. What? explained one of the guards standing by. Show me what you did. And she replied, 
I carried the dinner plate for my father every day while he worked up there, she replied. You see, her part, even though it was a humble little side part, was part of the bigger picture. And sometimes we need to look at that, even the most smallest parts of what we do, whether it's serving tea to the people that come to church, whether it's helping to clean up afterwards. All of those things are part of the kingdom. All of those things help to make it what it, God intended it. And we mustn't forget that we are part of that kingdom. We are God's fellow workers. We are servants of the Most High God. And I want to leave that with you. And I want to say no more excuses. We need to look to Him as our Redeemer and our King. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you again for your words, words of encouragement, words that train us and teach us in righteousness so that we can be fully equipped to do your work. Lord, we thank you that we have weeks ahead that we can still go out and share you with all those around us, our neighbors, our friends, our family. And we pray that we are diligent in what we do and we take strength from what you have shown us that we can do that. Lord, we just thank you for chance to be your servants, to be able to do your work. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.